What's up guys, it's Talon. Today we're gonna to be coaching a master support player and really talking about how to play engaged supports because she plays more enchanters than engaged supports. So a lot of the focus is around making space and really understanding how to engage and how to play tank support champions. There is one point in the video where it kind of cuts out and then we go a little later. The reason for that is because she's stopped being able to hear me for a little bit. So it, the recording is a little bit weird, but overall, um, if there's confusion, that's why that happened. Uh, if you're interested in coaching yourself from a rank 5 Sovereign Autofill player for just $15 an hour, just DM me on Discord, Talon1169, or through the link in the description to my Discord server as well. If you're interested in coaching, and uh, yeah, let's get right into the video. But like 99% of my games on Duo with um, one of a few ADCs. Yeah. So first, small thing I would recommend, um, the strongest point of most tank supports, or one of the strongest points, is level 2 which would mean that you're not really going to want to go um, this support item. Relic Shield allows you to get level 2 quicker because you can hit the like second minion, or the first minion of the second minion wave. That'll give you level 2 and make it a lot better oh, for okay. engaging. So typically, for most tank supports, I, su I uh, prefer going that. Also, I uh, don't walk up for this word. So something that we need to understand is how like a matchup goes. So for are you looking... Actually, didn't see the specific matchup we're against. Okay, we're against Lux and Lucian. Draven, obviously, I'm sure we know, is very good early game, very good at all inning. And so when you see your ADC walking up like this, we don't want to be walking for a ward. We just want to be following him. And basically, whatever your ADC decides to do, especially in solo queue, we just have to go along with them. Because what's going to end up happening is he might walk into that bush and just die. And this ward that you're doing, it doesn't give you much information at all. Because... Generally speaking, in the early game, the main information that you want to gain is where the jungler is starting. And this word's going to expire by the time the jungler is even really going to be in a position to possibly gank you. And you could do this word anyways after level 2, because you're going to have priority with the Draven. So it's then going to last longer. You're probably actually going to be able to spot out the jungler, because you'll have more time after pushing the wave to then go ward all the way up onto like his blue buff, for example. And you're also not in danger if they come here and try to kill you, basically. So. Oh, Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then we can see what ends up happening. And this is Draven's fault, but he almost was in a dangerous spot. He takes a lot of damage, whereas if we're in the, a position there, it's potentially better. Also, I think, I don't play Maokai specifically, but you're starting your second ability. I'm pretty sure that's not the sapling, right? Like, the sapling, I think, is typically what people like starting on support Maokai, because level so, one's... Oh, yeah, go ahead. I do usually start sapling however multiple times when i've played with like an aggressive laner like a draven lucian i get them upset because they want to kind of go all in level two and now yeah. i only have a sapling in like one of my abilities so generally when i'm with a draven or like a particular laner i do start with my uh, cc abilities yeah i think that's a fair enough reason that that does make sense so as long as you're doing it in like poke matchups then it's fine and then here really just weird situation breaks out so i guess this is a more unique situation but there's nothing really wrong with how you play it's just a strange like auctions here level two but yeah i mean it worked <laughs> out in the end so but yeah main thing so far just the wording thing and then something weird like this happening it's not the end of world under the world but just following like our teammates decision making in general because then raven wouldn't have been in lo as low and we would have had a potential all in the angle earlier so also, did you, I think you tried to clear the minion here. Was this like an accident or did you do it I on was, purpose? I was trying to dash for Lucian, okay. but I didn't actually see that there was a minion behind the turret there. Gotcha. So it, it auto-aimed on the minion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this word also never really does anything, so I think wording is one of the first things that we can keep track of. The only time that you're really going to want to do this word is when you're getting pushed under your turret and you're worried about a dive, because then you'll be able to spot a jungler before they dive you. But you're in a lane matchup that is relatively good for you, like you're very aggressive, good early game. Not really going to give us much value. Again, early game, generally speaking, we want to push a wave under their turret and then use that time to find a roam or find words. Because these words, as much as they feel nice, most junglers are going to gank through here anyways. Maybe he does gank through here, but even if he, by the time you spot him, you only have about a second or two to react. It's not really that much more beneficial than just not even having a word even, there, and you could just sapling there too, so. Even if, um, if, even if it's a Kha'Zix, because sometimes they come from behind, like from over that wall where I'm kind of standing right now. 
Yeah, so it's not going to be that beneficial or as beneficial as a ward on their camps if you can get that. So again, it can be helpful okay. into a Kha'Zix if we don't have a better ward option. But even into a Kha'Zix, if we're actually able to understand where he's pathing, then we'll be able to track him a lot quicker and understand when we can be aggressive where, uh, compared to when we can be like more passive. Whereas when you do a ward like this, you don't get information until so late that... If you're already pushed up, it doesn't really matter, you know what I mean? So, say you have two yeah. words, you know, maybe you throw one word in there if you have an additional one, but... Okay. And then we'll go back to just, like, the position here. So, when your teammate is playing really aggressive, and you're on an aggressive um, support, you need to be in a position to try to, like, stop him from inting. But basically here, what you should do when they're split up like this, you have to choose someone to target. And obviously it doesn't make sense to target the person next to the turret, so you should pretty much just walk straight at Lux here at this point, and she cannot possibly do anything. You could easily knock her into your Draven and potentially should be able to blow her up and just kill her when they're this separated. So she, basically she whenever they're separated... She still has her root, though. She still has a root, though, doesn't she? That won't matter. I didn't see her use it. Oh, you'll, okay. be able to, you'll be able to uh, use your second ability to just get onto her before she's a even able to root you. And your okay. life is not as valuable as your ADC is anyway. So, like, in the current position that your ADC is in, he is dead 1,000% if we don't do something about it. And as much as I know you're like, like it's going to be like, well, my teammate is just making a bad play. He's inting, and this is true. He shouldn't be in a position that he's in. It doesn't really matter. We have to find a way to play around it. And a champion like Draven, very good early game, and can make these aggressive plays. So if you just go on someone who's separated, you're going to blow them up. And even if you don't end up killing them, it's going to be a better scenario than your Draven dying because you're at least likely going to trade one for one, and even if you don't, you're probably not going to die as as well as him. Like, they're just not going to have enough damage, you know? So. Okay. Essentially, like, it's... Because what even happens here if you do... Uh, your teammate does die and you're alive is exactly what we see here, where you're stuck to just go and recall so even if you would have given them 300 gold in the worst case scenario where you do die, they, you'd likely clear your wave, you'd at least kill someone, get 300 gold back. They, they would get basically the same benefit regardless. It doesn't matter whether or not you actually die, it's not going to change that much. Whereas the potential reward from going in and actually following up on your teammates' uh, play is just a lot more beneficial. So okay. does that kind of make sense? Or? Yeah, no, that totally does. Yeah. Okay. Another thing for itemization and... You know, not everyone agrees with this. I know that if you're playing hard steel, you want to stack up your hard steel as quick as possible. But your early game is so much weaker if you don't rush your boots, and then you're not able to be aggressive at all in the early game. And so, I, as a tank support, I hate going hard steel instantly. Like I'll, you know, rush my boots and then get hard steel because my early game's a lot stronger. And you're not really going to get hard steel in turf until first dragon, and it's not really going to get stacked up that much. So it's just, to me, rushing boots. Because say you had rushed uh, steel caps here especially into they have auction and lucian if you go on lucian he's dealing way less damage to you whereas with the items that you have you're still really squishy and have like no real resist so mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense and then another note here we should also kind of acknowledge that our draven sucks at this point and be trying to push the wave as quick as possible and roaming a lot so in a minute i think yeah. i do did and roam <laughs> um yeah yeah, and so in this scenario, like, um, generally speaking, once we decide on the fact that our teammate's not good, we want to start just hitting the wave really quickly. So even in, like, a scenario here where the wave is just right here, we should just start autoing it a bunch. And then, oh, again, okay. like, once we get onto this wave, just instantly auto it, just try to push it as quick as possible. Because, again, obviously this is hindsight, but, like, then had we been moving 10 seconds earlier, this fight here is actually just a kill for us because our teammate's in that situation. Obviously, you have no way of knowing that. But creating the scenario to be able to roam quicker gives you more opportunities to be helping on the map to people who matter. So basically, once you do realize your teammate sucks, or even if he doesn't suck, if he just falls behind, then we want to start really just hard, hard pushing the wave, even if our teammate gets mad at us, so that we can then rotate and help our team a lot more, basically. Yeah, that, that makes sense, actually. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you can alt and turn, yeah. Like, even here... I would just walk up and bait with my life. Like, you're not going to die to Auction there. And he's going to walk I a lot farther. I didn't cast it in, to be honest, until yeah, okay. the last second. Gotcha. And then I didn't count on Draven to help much. So I didn't want to... Gotcha. So yeah, yeah, just in the future, then having awareness of our teammates' location so we can understand when we can walk up would be beneficial. But yeah, that makes sense if you didn't notice that. 
and then even here as a support i'm going to be paying let's we got the scoreboard now this is good that we can look at what's going on so volley bear is their top laner okay so camille's not in the best spot but she's not doing that bad raven is zero and four clearly sucks at the game cast it in and is our real only strength so pretty much at this point in my mind i'm going for like a, to, to path around cassadin and i would ping as much as i can to the herald and try to get my jungle to go there now if your jungler ends up going for the the dragon you have to follow but i would really try to get them to go towards that and the rest of the game i would just permanently play around like the mid lane and look to get my cast in really ahead basically which is what obviously we do end up going through mid here which is good I was think I was gonna go ward the dragon first, and then yeah, yeah, because I noticed that Jax was bot side, so I didn't want to go up to top side unless yeah, he... that's perfectly fine how you play this, and I would just use pings more often to try to get my teammate to do what I want, but if they don't end up following, then you know they don't follow, and that's perfectly fine. And yeah, now that the turret's gone, we really never have to come back to bot side kind of for the rest of the game. Should pretty much just per like even here, you should be in mid lane right now, playing around again like the only mm -hmm. real strength that we have. I was just trying to get gold, I think, for uh, for boots. Yeah, because I and... realized that I really needed the boots, and you're right, I probably should have bought them first. So, mm -hmm. but you could even get that gold from the mid lane. Like it's perfectly fine to share some of that gold or XP just in the mid around our stronger points. That's just like the main the main point about especially playing tank supports is we have to pretty like quickly identify the actual people that are going to help us win the game and the ones who aren't and then play really heavily around that. So like um so with the I think the way I usually if I if I need gold and I was going to share it with someone I would usually want to share it with someone who's not going to make a big impact on the game so that Cassidy would get a full wave to himself, you know what I mean? Am I Cassidy wrong? Doesn't to get do less that? gold from you being around the wave as long as you don't take oh. the last hit. He only gets less XP. So the only thing you're doing is giving a bit less XP, oh, which in the I long run is not that. Too. Yeah, no, it's not going to be a big deal. So yeah, not gold, just XP, and it's not enough XP to like. If you're sharing like ten waves in a row, obviously it's enough XP to matter, but it's not if you're getting one or two waves. I see. And just generally speaking, just as a tank support player, especially in solo queue, we really don't need to be concerned with our teammates. Frankly, like it's should be playing very selfishly and then just playing as much around the strong point as we can so okay well that's good to know and then yeah i mean if cassidy gets to three items this game is still very winnable so just anytime we're in a position where we can maybe make plays for them i don't necessarily mind wasting your flash since there's no objective or anything up obviously it didn't work up but work out but that's fine yeah, I thought I could shove him into the Cassidin and yeah. get one of them picked off, but... And so yeah, I would just use the vision thing, try to see if they have any words, and then just again hover towards the middle. The main thing too, the mid turret's really low, so the goal should be to play around the mid turret. Even here, I honestly think you could have like walked up, like I'm pretty sure we can just walk up and actually like get... Uh, w onto deluxe or at least back her off like i think i've seen multiple times where it does seem like you somewhat play like an enchanter on tanks a little bit in terms of like you're a little too worried about your life and your health and not using it as a resource like here again just walking up so that they're scared of you so that your cast in who again we've acknowledged is the way that we can win the game isn't threatened as much and i realistically do think that once your all came up you would kill them both if you're just walking up okay I, I do mostly play enchanters, um, like, probably 80% of the time, and so tanks are something that I've been newly kind of trying. So yeah. That might be why. <laughs> yeah, and they have a lot more potential to, like, carry games tanks do, so it's definitely good to, to be used to playing them when you need tanks. But, but yeah, I, I can see kind of the... Like, even here, I would walk up and just... Again, your cast in, we can be aware, is on the map... Try to just pressure mm -hmm. them to not get this turret. If you do die, it's not the end of the world because there's no objective up. So your death isn't the worst, right? 
your death would be an additional, I think, since you have some kills, maybe four or 500 gold. And that four or 500 gold realistically is not going to change whether or not we lose the game. But your mid turret being up very likely could save someone's life in the future or actually give you priority over a dragon when it's coming up. And even here, I do think you could probably bait them into possibly going on you. They'd be scared, and then your cast in comes, and you either kill them or at least save them mid-turret. And again, worst-case scenario isn't that bad of a scenario. So. Okay. So basically, I just need to, like, jump in more. It's not about jumping in. It's about creating space is usually the term people use. You don't actually... It's just the threat of you existing and being there that's important, which has multiple times really been the thing. Like, had you done what I said in that earlier play, and then it turns out that they just back off, that's fine. It's more about the fact that you're in the position to follow up. Even, again, with your Draven early on level 3, your Draven goes up, you're not trying to find the Lux, you're just trying to play safe and play how you think is correct. Which, again, if you're a duo or you're communicating with someone, you can play in that way, but when you're relying on your solo queue teammates' decision-making, you kind of have to be a little more willing to follow up on how they play, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that does make sense. Okay. And then, also, I'll go back here since I was talking during it, but, um... You're, again, Kasten. Once again, we've identified as the person we should play around. Kasten goes bot lane here, you should be bot lane. Like, we should... It should be really early that we're deciding... Like, even like here, so Kasten's... Follow him around? Yeah, literally, like, is it's... Maybe it sounds silly. You're following the person who matters around. Not literally always, like, there are some scenarios where you can't follow your carry, but Kasten... The, old, the way Kasten works, the way most mages slash AP champs that are carries will work, most of the time, three items is their biggest power spike. Kasten's three item power spike is larger than any other champions because he has two stacking items that he'll typically build with Archangels and Rod of Ages, and then he'll build Deathcap's third item. Once he hits those three items, he's pretty much able to one-shot everyone and can literally solo win a team fight. So your only goal is to make sure that he can get to that point in the game. Camille is a self-sufficient champion who can split push even if she's behind. Your Draven is brand new to the game, so that's unfortunate. And your jungler is going to follow around wherever the plays are happening anyways. So it's just very clear that in this situation, we should be following him. Now say you had like a Jax top lane who was really fed, who's you know a great split pushing champion. You're not going to follow him 24-7 because his job is different. His job is to split push and to draw pressure as your team, you know, fights in different scenarios. So there you wouldn't play around him as hard. But when you have a fed mid laner who really wants to get to a certain item spike and you have no other points of strength, then you're going to really hard follow them around. Okay. Because, like, say your Draven wasn't complete ass, like, you could, you know, you wouldn't quite have to follow the cast so heavily. Too. Like, it's obviously different depending on the game, but this game we really only have a singular win condition and nothing else matters, whereas other games there's multiple different avenues of how we can win and we can be more reactive to how the enemy play rather than really playing around our teammates. But also mm -hmm. jungle and mid are generally the champs who we want to link up the most with in the mid game and make a lot of plays around because they have the most agency to roam, whereas your top laner is usually stuck catching side waves and your bottom laner is usually just looking for ghouls so they can carry team fights. So... If you don't know what to do and you have no specific points of strength, generally following the, the mid and the jungle around is, is how we want to play the game. Okay. And obviously in an ideal scenario, he would have been mid with you because then you can get the turret. And so it is good to have to, to play for the turret, but it's a lot less beneficial because you're getting the local gold rather than him getting it when we take it by ourselves like this, for example. Yeah. And then an additional thing, sense. looking at the scoreboard now, because um, this is another thing I know you said was a little bit of an issue in terms of um, like finding who you should engage on or finding engages. And so using the scoreboard to kind of determine what will potentially happen and try to think about how a fight will go before it goes is very important. The dragon spawning in 50 seconds, so we can expect a dragon or, or a fight soon. And so before that, we should take account of who we want to target and how we want to play the game. So we've already acknowledged that obviously we need to make sure Kasten can follow up on us in whatever situation we go in on. But then looking at the enemy, Kha'Zix is relatively weak. We don't really need to worry about him. The Akshan is horrible. We don't care about him. And Volibear, obviously too tanky to really kill. So unless it's like a free kill, we're not going to go on him. So that leaves two champions that we can go on. And then when we're deciding on who to go on, we need to determine what spells and what ways that they can possibly react to us. So Lux obviously will root us or flash away if we go in, but our second ability means that flashing, it doesn't matter. She, she won't be able to flash unless she flashes after we get onto her. So we don't really have to worry too much about flashes. And then Lucian will only exhaust her dash. Again, we can follow dashes. 
So generally speaking, the only thing you're trying to do is surprise Lux enough where you can get your second ability onto her before she roots you, or just get onto Lucian whenever he goes. So you're pretty much in the fight looking for those two people and not trying to do too much else, unless you need to like protect someone or save their life or something. Okay. And then obviously it ends up, you just try to, have to save your teammates, so you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It is, it is, but we did have to waste our ult, which is a little unfortunate. And then I also don't know exactly why you sapling the bush there, because we should be starting to focus our attention more on the dragon and getting vision and saplings around the dragon and warding and these types of things, since the objective's spawning soon. I think it's just because Cassidy was recalling, and I just wanted to make sure the bush was, like, um, gotcha. empty, but I, I sapling too late. He had already pretty much yeah, recalled yeah. by then. And then even this wave, I don't think you really needed to go on. I think it'd be better to have started getting control of a bush and, and warding and whatever. And this ward is only really a good ward if we like are just purely playing for a steal and nothing else. But it's not going to help us in the fight at all. Because no one's going to like engage a fight through here. So better wards would either be this bush. I don't know if you can see where my cursor is, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like this bush, or the best word that you can get is over their wall, over their blue buff, or right in this area. Basically, as deep as you can get it, so you can get vision of them and then control the area initially. Now, obviously, it's hard because your teammates are strangely on the wrong side of the map, and there's nothing you can do yeah. about that occurring. But you could, you know, sapling this bush to make sure no one's necessarily in there. Then walk into this bush here, try to ward over here, and basically just try to get control. O earlier of the objective rather than focusing as much on the mid wave because generally as a tank support you want to be in a position where you can find people so that if someone gets caught it's best if you get caught because you have ways to escape you have your flash up your gargoyle is almost up your w can allow you to escape and even if you get caught it takes a lot more resources to kill you right okay i think i, I was just trying to push the wave because generally i know you're supposed to try to get prio before objectives yeah and i didn't see that anybody was really trying to uh to push the waves but yeah yeah no i see your are. point that you 100 percent are supposed to get prio of the objective it's just the job of the support is to make it easier for your teammates to hit the wave and get prio and it makes it a lot safer for your teammates to do so if you get vision now say yeah, like there are scenarios where you just need to get the wave when nobody's getting it, and it's hard to always explain every like nuanced scenario of you know when you would or wouldn't want to go there. The main reasons that it was good to go for vision there, one, the enemy jungle was dead, so it's more likely that we can get control, and two, you have people still rel roughly in the area, so even if they lose a minion or two, they're most likely going to go there. And so it's just going to make it safer and easier for your teammates to go there. Um, for the same reason, we should be hovering the bot side right now. The dragon is up. All right, so main thing that I was... And just, yeah, if you don't, if you end up stop hearing me again, just, just tell me. But um, main thing, again, two issues, I guess. One, our teammate, again, we're letting be in front of us when we should even just be at this point in the bush because then we'd find an angle onto Lux, for example. But even more than that, we should be following the teammates who matter in the fight. So again, like when your teammates even here are deciding, like you're, you see how close you are to Kasten. You're in a very close, right, proximity to Kasten. You can follow where they go. But then Kasten starts making a play here and you decide to stay in the bush and wait to find and engage on the people who don't matter once again because they're going on your draven your draven at this point we just have to accept doesn't matter play a lot more around our carries but even again in this fight you don't need to walk so far back you have a bush you're tanky if you get caught it's not the end of the world you need to again go forward and just make them able to deal less damage to your guy because then you have camille here you have two people here they can all collapse and come help you guys it doesn't matter if your Draven dies, it matters if you CC people and keep them there long enough so that your team can all collapse afterwards. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, so should I have, like, used my alt, like, as soon as I saw Volley coming up? No, so I'll uh, go back. In the, okay, what you should do, so first of all, should be at this point in the bush, right? Like, on the very tip, and then your teammate walks up here. What you should be doing is starting to walk up as you see your teammate being an idiot, because we know that we have other things that will help us. Again... Again, to be clear, you should have been with the cast in, but now that we are in this position, as soon as your Draven is walking forward like this, you should immediately go on to Lux, because that's the damage dealer. We need to target the damage dealer in the fights, not the person who is really tanky and really hard to kill. And then just keeping the Lux see. there long enough, she's not going to deal enough damage to you anyway, because you're extremely tanky. You just hit Twin Guard, which is a great item spike as well. And then being on her, you're going to be locking her up long enough. After you W onto her, you can then ult as follow-up. You should have W'd in first, then ulted. Again, even here, you went in the volley. We should be on the Lux. 
um, and then our team would be in a good position to probably end up killing both. And it looks like we do kill both um, anyways, but it would have been a lot smoother. Okay, and then, yeah, so ends up being a lot more messy because of that. I see. Okay, so I should have been with Cassidin, but barring that, I should have gone on to the Lux first. Yeah. And again, I will write okay. down more specific, like, um, things to focus on so that, obviously, these are all situational and we'll have more general things that we can actually implement into specific games but like the main parts about your gameplay so far that need fixing are understanding who to play around and then understanding who to target as well as being okay with dying or taking damage and just being more aggressive not just in like going forward and going in but in just positioning in a way that set creates some separation between your carries and squishy champions and the enemy rather than you positioning more like kind of an enchanter champion Okay. Yeah, it's definitely an adjustment. Yeah. Going from enchanters to tanks. It definitely is for sure. I mean, I used to be, I was originally like a Nami one trick, so I understand the difference from switching. And obviously now I play like a lot of Thresh and stuff, so I, I do get that. Yeah, not Nami's my main champion that I would normally play, but I just find I can't really win games with her anymore. Do you have an? Is it another tank replay or is it an enchanter replay for the second one? Uh, no, it's a it's a tank replay. Okay. I like I know how to play Nami. Like I don't I don't find like I'm confused as when I lose I kind of know exactly why we lost. Gotcha. But with tanks, like I have no like I I would I was watching this replay like I probably watched it three times and I literally couldn't figure out why like what I did wrong. So I'm really like. Everything you're saying, it's like, oh, I like I didn't see it before. So Gotcha, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's um, kinda you, why I wanted you to go over these ones. I know there's Yeah. Yeah. I know. And even for example, for um sorry to cut you off. I just thought another thing that I wanted to talk about. But even here, um, like when we're positioning just when our team's on mid waves, we can position a lot more around bushes and a lot less standing on the wave. Like standing on the wave doesn't really give you much value and it shows where you are. So the enemy don't have to really worry about you. They don't have to be fearful or anything. Um, we should hover towards the Baron because that's the objective that's currently up. And we should just be in this bush. Like we have flash up, we have all we have ways to escape. It gives your teammates more position so that or more vision so they can walk forward more aggressively. It puts you in a position where if your Camille gets caught, you have a quicker track to get to her and you're still in a position to help your cast them. So we're kinda we just need to be more aggressive even on the waves, just in the bushes and rather than just sitting kind of on it like this. I see. Okay. Like even here, Draven's walking stupidly up. Be right in front of him, just like so that if someone doesn't, you can be there. Flash here, just like again, your goal is to save that guy's life. You should just flash because if he's dead, you just pretty much lose. So you should be a lot more like yeah, urgent and trying to have save him. To help Cassidy earlier. Yeah. yeah and I mean, Cassidy might have died because that was their mistake. Like, don't get me wrong, it was dumb of them, but we kind of have to just try to save people despite their dumb mistakes. I like that you go on Lux. I would have even flashed towards like the the mid turret there because you would have had quicker protection. But I like the idea of just trying to get onto the Lux. Like at this point in the game, is it still like winnable? Let's look at the scoreboard quick. I think you had the scoreboard up a second ago. Yeah. Yeah, you're ahead in gold is most definitely winnable. You're ahead in gold with one of the best scaling champions in the entire game on his best power spike. It is extraordinarily winnable at this point. And your Camille just killed this. I don't know if she ends up getting the inhib, but either way, you have amazing scaling too. Cassidy, Camille, Jax are all great scaling champions, and Maokai is still a pretty good, you know, late game champ as well. Again, if you approach fights in terms of Targeting these two people, the Lux and the Lucian, ideally getting onto the Lucian at this point because we see how strong he is. And you're positioning yourself in a way, as we've been speaking about, where your teammates have a lot more space to walk forward and make plays. They're not going to have these random deaths that occur. Like a lot of these deaths you can prevent from your teammates. A lot of them you can't as well, obviously. But it is, it is, I would rather be in your situation than the enemy's situation. And obviously now that your teammates just won this fight, it's, you're just in a very winning position. 
Like, your okay. team should go Baron here, which again, even here, I would ping, you know? Like, I want you to be pinging things and just trying to, like, sort of lead your team more because I haven't seen us ping yet. And it, it's kind of a hard habit to get into. I like the email, though, you know, supporting the team. That's good. But I, I just try to ping as much as possible whenever an objective's up so that my team is, is always just aware of it because sometimes it's just as simple as they don't even realize that the objective is up. Okay. And then I think you might be the one to take the T-Rex because I don't... If Kassadin takes it, that's so true. I was gonna go back and take it. I was just trying to set up some uh, vision there, but I think Kassadin ends up taking it, actually, if I recall this game. Yeah. I even pinged that I was going yeah. to take it, and I pinged him away from it, and yeah, he that's still really took unlucky. it, which I think is... Uh, yeah, that was a big, big mistake. Yeah, I hate when the carries take it, but... Not much we can do. Now this is pretty much just a waste of T-Rex because our teammates died. But in terms of uh, like everything, we should still mostly be fine. We just have to use this T-Rex to get vision up like in the dragon area. So this is the first already kind of mistake is uh, using a sapling there. We need to be controlling the bottom side bush because the elder is spawning in a minute. And so pretty much everything that we do needs to be around that side of the map. Even here you should be hovering in the bottom side bush for example. Just Trying as much as you can to get control over that. <laughs> Fuck you too. <laughs> Your teammate is not happy, it seems. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Um... Yeah, and there's nothing you can do to engage until your cast and gets out of the T-Rex, so you pretty much just have to sit back and hope that... I think I, guess... I was pretty upset at this point, too. <laughs> yeah. I guess I would look for a pick with like Jax or something to one shot someone if it's possible, but for the most part, you can't do much if this happens. He didn't even really push a turret with it. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing, but even here, and it still really is. <laughs> it, it, again, it it's like your teammate's fault. Like, but but as as much as it is your teammate's fault, we still need to be positioning in a way more aggressive, you know, stance at this point. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the most meaningful fight of the game, and we're letting our Jax kind of solo up here, which, again, should have been around these bushes. When you saw your teammate going forward, you could have been in a position to follow them up to at least do what you could. And then, you know, maybe you kill two, but three or four of you die. Kassadin eventually comes out of T-Rex, maybe team wipes them because the Kassadin is very strong. But when we're positioning like this, even here, again, that ward doesn't do anything for us. These types of things, we just need to be a lot more aggressive with our positioning and warding when we're in a position of power, because we would have been in a great spot. And I mean, it looks like this is kind of winning, too. Okay, so this is this is a mistake as well in terms of engage. So, uh, like, if you're going to go on someone, you'd go on the 1 HP person to flash on, but your Kassadin is not able to follow up, and Draven is way behind. So flashing on someone who's nearly full HP is never really going to do anything for us, so we would wait to use our flash, basically, until Kassadin's out of T-Rex or Draven's a lot closer. Because now this leads to our Draven then ending up probably dying. Then you're going to maybe die, and then Kassadin's going to be left alone. So you should even here just back up at this point and let your Kassadin come out of the T-Rex before really looking for anything rather than continuing the fight. Okay. And so it, it once again is just awareness of teammates positioning and being more aggressive with like our positioning. It's not even, again, about going in super quickly, which I think is like one thing that I might not be clear on is that it's more just about being in a position where if your teammates do go in, you can follow up really quickly and also making the enemy more fearful to walk forward because just if they see a Maokai, they're not just going to walk into that, right? Whereas if you're behind warding the dragon like you were or whatever, they're not scared to go on your teammates, then it can let a fight break out a lot earlier before you're in a position to follow up. Like in hindsight, I do think this is 100%. This should have been a winnable game through our own actions. We could have influenced the game at this last elder fight even to be a win so okay that that's the sense i was getting that i'm clearly doing something wrong in most of these games so this makes a lot of sense yeah and i mean it is harder to identify because a lot of the mistakes are more like um they're not mistakes of it's easy to identify a mistake when you like die or something but a lot of these mistakes are the fact that we're not dying funnily enough like i think you having more deaths might <laughs> even be a beneficial thing many times just because of the nature of how you're playing the game so it's it's harder to identify those types of things sometimes if you don't know specifically what to look for yeah even again obviously i keep pointing it out 
but even here i would be walking up more aggressively toward this bush like we eventually do and just getting control over that because we know they're going to go barren so again this is a consistent mistake with our saplings and with our vision control you're consistently throwing things on the wrong side of the map Baron is the only thing that matters. Elder Dragon just got taken, just like before Baron was taken. And so we need all of our vision, all of our resources on the side of the map, which the objective is spawning on. And we just need to play like a lot more around that side. Because once again, they could be forcing, and say your teammate, like your Draven walks up dumbly here. It's entirely possible someone was camping that bush and your Draven dies. But if someone camping that bush catches you, you don't die because you're a lot tankier. I see. That was really good, though, by you to save. Um, what you call it acid in. that's generally like how i normally like i have a hard time like engaging when nobody's in danger if that makes sense yeah. like i kind of often i'm like looking to see who's about to die and i think that's just because i normally am playing an enchanter where i'm trying to shield or heal the right person yeah so I can definitely when there's see that. just like five people in a big clump i literally don't know what to do a lot of the times or like who to engage on I get that for sure and then another small thing which is something important to note when playing engaged champions is not using all of your cc instantly and waiting until the enemy kind of use something like you use this really early and so what this does on a champion who you're not catching him he, you're just trying to save your teammate when you go on him like this you're you basically give him a boost like towards your teammate like it doesn't really help much you would wait until he's a lot closer to your teammate and be on an angle where you can push him away from him. Because when you use all of your CC, now he has time where he can easily go onto your cast and, and you don't really have abilities to peel. Whereas had you waited until he's closer onto him or until he's used his first ability, for example, then you would be able to save your teammate a lot more. Yeah, I see. I'm guessing they'll get Baron in the end here, but I guess we'll see. We'll see if there's anything specific to learn from. I mean, at this point, you're just trying to defend. And, you know, it is what it is. Yes, this is a duo, and it's actually not like a live replay. I just recorded like an actual. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um. At comp here. But generally, our main goal this game in terms of engaging would probably be going on like Jinx, but it's either going on Jinx or just peeling for our team because they have like a lot of very aggressive champs apart from Jinx. I actually Again, have yep. a like, really hard time into set specifically. Like, whenever there's a set support, I really struggle. Not sure exactly why, but. We'll watch and we'll see, but again, first mistake is the same one as the first game. The ward, this gives you a lot, and then we see here it actually could have resulted if Fizz wasn't bad in something a lot more worse, like a lot worse for us. And again, it's just uh, something we need to understand about bot lane in general, is that it matters so much getting control over the first wave and being the first one on that, getting that wave pushed so that we can have the control over the lane so that once the second wave comes, we get the first minion of the second wave before the enemy do. That allows us to then uh, get level 2, and that's basically the biggest power spike in one of the most important parts of any bot lane. Whereas when you play it like this, you end up getting the wave a little later, they have vision of you so they know exactly where you are, and then they're just able to be a lot more aggressive on you. Now, in this matchup, Set is going to have a lot stronger combat power than Maokai level 1, because Maokai's level 1 is not very strong. And so not having complete control over the wave and uh, potentially allowing them to get level 2 first is fine. But the issue with how you're playing this lane is you're just playing it a lot too scared once you have an opportunity to walk into the bush. So for example here, you can walk all the way up into this bush and just hover here. You don't need to hover on the back side of it. You can hover on the front so that your teammate has the opportunity to walk up on the wave. And again, just putting yourself between the opponents. It's better if you die or if you take damage than your teammate does. So you just need to be in a better position to give your teammate a little more confidence to walk forward. But because of the fact that you're into set, I'm not saying you need to like hard engage level 1 or level 2 because... That is his strength, so it's perfectly fine. Um, another issue, though, is that you're targeting set really hard. So once the set does go on you like this, you either just back off or you go on to Jinx because that's the damage dealer. When you just target the set like this, he wants that because the way set works, the more you hit him, the more, I don't know, like the white bar under him will build up. Yeah. It gives him a bigger yeah. shield and more damage. And so we don't want to build that bar up. Generally, we're going to want to target the AD carry instead. 
So if he engages on Varus, yeah, then I have to kind of leave him behind and go to Jinx. Like, is is that what you're saying, or am I? Like... Yes, yes, because Jinx does more damage than Set would do to your teammate. And even if you do go on set, he's still going to be able to stick on your teammate, deal damage, and then Jinx is going to get damage. So you're denying a lot more damage by going on the Jinx, generally speaking. Now, you know, there's scenarios where the set is super low and you just you want to go on him and kill him, right? Like, it depends what scenario specifically we're in. And then obviously here, I, I don't think I need to talk about... Obviously, we shouldn't have flashed forward and gone on them. This, this is kind yeah, of what leads I, I, to the bigger... Yeah, he was deceivingly low health, and uh, <laughs> I thought I could uh, finish him off. Yeah, and so... Obviously, we were incorrect about the fact that we could kill him, but even if we, in a hypothetical scenario, could kill him, it's not a good idea to try to kill him here, because you clearly would understand that at least the best you're going to trade is one for one, right? Set's going to... Yeah, yeah, you, right. you would die to Jinx. And Jinx getting a kill is way better than Maokai getting a kill. Even Set getting a kill is better than Maokai getting a kill. So in terms of the trade, it still wouldn't be beneficial for us, but I do understand, yeah. obviously, if you thought you could potentially kill, so... Yeah, that, that, it was a dumb move. Yeah, but it is what it is. So yeah, generally in tank versus tank matchups, you're targeting the ADC when you can. It's pretty rare that you're going to hard target the tank unless they're like really out of position. And you're going to use your ignite because you also ignited the set and we're going to want to generally ignite the um, AD carry. And then even here, our goal should be to hard push this wave with our teammate. The reason that you want to hard... I think I saw Talon and I was trying to help, but... Yeah. So our teammate... Our, our talent, I don't know why he's up here specifically, it's kind of strange, but we're going to be able to help him a lot more, and with our AD carry, if we push the wave, like, if you're coming straight right right here, you hit this wave with your teammate, obviously as well, um, when you have Relic Shield, as we spoke about, that's also helpful, you'll mm -hmm. be able to push it with him in 5 to 10 seconds, relatively quickly, you're also duo, so you can ping attack and they'll probably actually listen to you, and then you're going to be able to move with better levels and with an additional teammate here, you don't see your teammate in any specific danger. Alan is an extremely mobile champion. It's very hard to kill him. He has flash up. He's not in any real immediate danger, and we don't see anyone specifically that we want to go on to. So in this scenario, it would be a lot more beneficial in the long run to get the gold, because you're also losing gold for yourself early game, which it matters more early game because you're losing the levels, and hitting level 5 as quick as possible is quite important on support. So you want to be able to get this wave with your teammate and then push afterwards, or roam afterwards. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't see set, but I was just trying to give Talon some vision of the jungle since I thought he was just trying to steal jungle camps. But yeah, I see your point. I should have gone straight to the lane. And Yeah. Um... And even if you were trying to give vision of the jungle, the only vision you gave is here where we don't give vision of a jungle camp. And he's further up than you, so you're not giving him vision of something he wouldn't know of because he sees mid lane um, and bot lane recalled, so they'd be coming from this direction as well. Yeah, that's true. The sapling is goaded, though. It got set, so... Crazy. And yeah, so we can kind of see as well in hindsight that um, the Talon now being over-aggressive, had we pushed this wave right away, that wave would be pushed, you'd be level 4, your Varus would be able to push and fight without losing this, and you would have been here a lot quicker, and then the fight would go really well. I think the fight ends up going well anyways, but we'd have that level advantage, and we'd have additional gold already pushed, so... Yeah, and then Talon goes, like, he went back in, so I didn't know, like... Oh, this is good by you to go in and save his life like that, for sure. I don't know why you walked back towards the wave, though. Like, you're full health. You really can, again, use your health a lot more as a resource. Like, even when you don't have anything specific, just walk at them here. Like, you should be in front. That Varus should be taking as little damage as possible as you're kind of taking a lot more, uh, like, damage from them and just a lot more pressure, which, again, similar mistake as, as to what we spoke about before mm -hmm. so i know i sound like a broken record that's kind of part of the point of the coaching is no that's good usually there is a, a couple things people really need to work on and reiterating it continuously often helps it be in people's minds better so that when you're in a game you can think about my annoying voice telling you what you need to do <laughs> and then you know you'll be hopefully doing that so no that's good that's what i want i wanted i wanted to see exactly what the issue was and it's since it's coming up so much this is clearly one of the main problems yeah and yeah, then I'll write down things um, and send them to you. And then typically, what I tell people in terms of the notes that I write down, I usually write, say, 5 to 15 things, roughly. Of those things, I would like you to probably choose 2 or 3 at a time. 
probably two or three things that apply during different parts of the game. For example, one thing that's an early game sort of mistake, and then one that occurs later on in the game. And focus your attention every game, every time you go into a game, on that specific mistake, and really only think about that. The rest of the game, just play autopilot how you normally would. And then once you feel like you've built that as kind of a habit or something that you're now like getting a lot better at, you move on to the next couple things until you feel like you've kind of implemented all of those notes into your gameplay. Because it's easier than doing like, you know, all 10 things at once. It's hard to keep track of everything and remember everything. And then this is the same scenario where we would have targeted Jinx here again um, when our teammate got engaged on. Okay, yeah. Is he building attack speed, Varus? It looks like his attack speed is very quick, or maybe it was just because he killed minion. But yeah, even again here, we can see like they're both like half health. Had we focused a specific target, and that target being the squishy target, the Jinx is 100% dead there. So. Okay. Um, your teammate's low health and he's gonna recall. I would probably go through mid initially because there's nothing we can really do bot lane here. The dragon's about to spawn and mid priority is very important before the objective. And so I'm not saying I'd want you to be clearing the wave, but I want you to be in that mid lane so that you can push it then with your Orianna once she's coming, get control over that, and then rotate into whichever side your teammate ends up going for. Whereas when you're going bot lane initially here, say your teammate does go top side out of base, you're in a much worse position to actually follow up. Um, yeah, oh so. yeah. Okay. And like I said, your Varus should be recalling right now, and then you being here doesn't do much. And now you should take Hexgate because your teammate's uh, going there. So again, we should play around the jungler's decision making here, because then you could probably even dive Camille afterwards, most likely. And yeah, when you have, do you have support items? I think you still have your support item. I don't think you finished it yet. Yeah, you still have it. When you have support item, clearing the wave by yourself is usually not beneficial unless like you really need to defend a turret, for example. But okay. And also, um, Varus is a pretty good champion on his own when you do need to leave him. Like you don't obviously want to always leave your teammates, but in this scenario. You're not as worried about Varus because he has pretty good wave clear, so he should, if he plays properly, be able to clear the wave and then be relatively safe in a 1v2. You would have that time to go to topside to make that play, and then you'd still be able to come back with the hex gate, and it wouldn't take too long, or you could even just recall and then come back. You would only be giving up one or two wave without your Varus, where he's going to most likely be okay. And even if he does die, we're going to probably kill the meal and get the entire top turret, which would be very beneficial. So just playing more around our jungler's choice of uh, like roaming is usually what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Now the the like exception to this would be say that you're stomping bot lane and the rest of your team's doing really bad, then just keep playing for the bot lane because that's again the win condition. So it does depend on who's actually strong and doing well in the game. But in this game, Talon's doing all right. Your top side it seems like it's doing all right. I don't have the scoreboard up, so I can't see for sure. But you're not doing especially well in bot lane, so um, for all those reasons, it would be better. And then even here again, we see the same mistake where your Varus is allowed to be in front of you, which he makes the mistake of walking forward, but you also make the mistake of not being in a position, you know, in front of him. So then we end up not being able to engage right away. You even kind of walk back scared to get engaged on when obviously you're not going to be the one really focused. And then it just leads to him not being in a good spot. Yeah. And even so here, how you targeted I... Jinx, yeah. Like, so to practice this and get better at it, um, would it just be like literally just always being in front of the carry or is it more nuanced than that? Like, is it just that I have to be near him? I mean, it's certainly like there's always situations like sometimes you do need to let your teammate die when he's inting. We need to just take into account the specific scenarios of the game. Generally speaking, when you have the ability to be in a bush or to hover in a bush, you should be in that bush in front of your teammates so that if he does get engaged on you're fine um like or they'll be fine rather and you'll be able to go on someone additionally when you have like flash up or you have ultimate or you have additional ways to escape you can be more aggressive with this positioning and you can be more passive when you don't have as many ways to like actually you know get out if something does go wrong but generally speaking i would say you should start with just being in front of your teammate as much as possible and making it like an I, I really like the idea of over forcing or over like uh, 
emphasizing that point in your gameplay to the point where you may just die and, and you might just be messing up by being over aggressive. I'd rather that you start with being really over aggressive and then tailor it back once you feel like you've learned from your specific mistakes. Because I can't teach you every unique scenario, but you know, I'm imagining say you're over aggressive and you die one time, you get caught out, and then you know, think about it after you die, think about why did I die? Maybe your jungler was recalling and you were way too aggressive when your team couldn't follow up. Or maybe the enemy had all of their ults up and you just used all of your ults or you didn't have flash or a ton of different scenarios that you can only really learn from from making the mistake because there is a lot of like specific things that you just can't take into account with just an hour of like coaching. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then another okay. thing here, once again, the fear, you just just keep tanking this, you know, like just stand here, just let your teammates kill the jinx, but you're really scared. You're full health. You should be tanking this until you're like one shot. Like, just as long as possible. Because again, if you die, it's not a big of a deal, but now your Varus dies here. And your Varus got a double kill, which means he's giving even more gold to the Jinx. Whereas had you died, mm -hmm. not as big of a deal. And your Varus being alive means your Varus gets to get more gold. Whereas now he's dead, can't get gold off of that good play that you guys ended up making. And realistically, you wouldn't have died had you tanked it, because you would have been able to get out in time. So again, kind of same theme as always, in, just in terms of being a little bit too afraid. Okay. But generally on turret dives, you do want to be the one taking the aggro. Another nice thing about Maokai specifically, um, if you are like really setting up a turret dive, you can just auto attack them to purposefully take the aggro and then use your second ability to drop aggro. So wait till you're you know low enough that you don't want to take damage more. And then instead of having to run out of the turret, you just use your second ability on the enemy and then you you'll drop the aggro. So. Oh, really? Because he becomes like untargetable for a minute? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that, that you could do that. Yeah, champions like Camille with her ultimate too and, and stuff like that can do that. But then would the aggro like go on to the next, like would it go to my teammates at that yeah, point? Yeah, that's why you're waiting as long as possible to W until you're low enough because you're taking as much possible damage as you can from it. Mm -hmm. And like in that scenario, for example, you guys would have killed before you even needed to drop the aggro. So. I see, okay. So it's basically about trying to tank as much as possible without dying because you're the least important member of the dive in terms of damage. So your job is just to take as much damage so your team has as much time to, to dive. Okay. And yeah, I don't mind this. The dragon spawning, you're going with your teammate for an objective. Your entire team dies topside. That's not on you. That's just unfortunate. But at this point, the game's obviously very hard. I do also like that you're trying to recall. I don't like that the Varus stays up because now, yeah. So that's not on you that this happens, but... It is what it is. But even here, again, you're running back further than your teammate, even just in this type of thing. It's just another habit. I just want you to be thinking, I want to be in front of him after that. Like, initially, it was fine that you were further away because you were trying to recall. And they were overextending. But once you're trying to save their life, just be the one in front because it's less likely that you die. It's less important that you die and all those things. Yeah, I think my phase rush was just faster than him, but... Yeah, also, is phase rush normal for Malka? I feel like the... Is that a thing people go commonly? Um, I, I mean, I've seen it before. I don't know if it's like common. I know a lot of people do aftershock, but I find that, um, in certain situations, I like, I have a hard time keeping up with like, say Talon, if he runs yeah. away, um, if I don't have like that extra movement speed. So I do yeah. like running it on Maokai in certain situations. Most of the time, I, I think probably like 70% of the time I would go aftershock. Yeah, I would definitely say also with the whole me trying to tell you to play more aggro and be more aggressive thing, Aftershock's going to allow you to do that more because if you're already positioned aggressively, you don't need that additional movement speed as much. And you also have more like buffer in terms of you're going to be tankier, so it's harder to die and harder to, to mm -hmm. make as many mistakes. So in my opinion, Aftershock sounds like it'd be a lot better. I'm not a Maokai player enough to like give you a definite answer, but I would definitely say that I would lean towards going Aftershock in most games. You also get um, more like more chance to use your combo with the phase rush because you know I kind of go in with uh, two yeah. abilities and an auto attack and then it'll like reset. So I kind of like that as well. Yeah, and that's definitely a preference thing. If you prefer it, stick to it. These types of small rune choices aren't things that I'm going to be overly like. You have to do this or the other thing. If it works for you, that's perfectly fine. Uh, again, which you end up do. I was going to say we need to hover towards the side of the objective, which you end up doing, so that's good.
Okay, they randomly started Baron. So I guess in hindsight, we probably should have had a ward on that. I didn't really notice that. But yeah, we probably should have ended up warding that once the objective spawns. But that's kind of a weird scenario where they sneak it like almost instantly. It spawned 15 seconds ago. And I didn't realize they had started it. Yeah, I no, no I mean, I honestly, that 100% is something I might have taken too. A um, couple small things mechanically that don't overly matter here, but like, you should ult towards this way to keep the two people back. Again, separation between the enemy carries and their tanks is what you really want to create more than stopping the set. And obviously the thought process is I don't want set to kill my team, but even if set doesn't kill them, Jinx is going to come here and get a reset. Your real goal is to stop Jinx from getting a reset, which means we should ult this way and just focus on, again, keep keeping the separation and making space for our teammates more than only focusing the tank kind of in the same way here. Yeah, and I again, see. Yeah, we kind of get in this scenario where we're just stuck and the only person we've killed is the least important person to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, now that you're saying it, I realize that I'm targeting, like, the tank a lot. Yeah. I think it's because they're the one engaging on the team. And so yeah, I'm it's the easiest one to, to go like... on, for sure. It makes sense. And also, I'm, like, trying to keep them from, like, killing the team because Set can 100% one-shot uh, Varus. Yeah. So... I don't know. That's why I have a hard time into Set. Because he can just, like, one-shot people. Yeah, he does have a lot of damage, but, like, the reality is the Jinx is going to have more damage and benefits more from a kill happening because she gets to reset, so keeping them separated. Mm -hmm. And also, a lot of times the set's not going to be able to straight-up one-shot someone. A lot of times your teammate's going to have a flash or an ult or some way to make some type of escape, and he's also, through one spell rotation, can't one-shot. It takes some time with auto-attacks, and he still has to do all that, so it's still going to be pretty hard, generally, for him to straight-up kill without any help. And you're only giving him more damage when you damage him. This second ability will then do more damage, so... Yeah, that's true. Even here, again, just go forward onto the Jinx, because your teammate is dying. And if you die as well, it's not as important as your teammate dying. Obviously, again, pointing out the same thing, so... I'm kind of going to skip through the rest, because I'm imagining we're going to see a lot of similar things. But we'll see if there's yeah, anything probably. else. Yeah, <laughs> probably. I mean, this is how generally the, the coachings go. Like, most of the time, it's similar mistakes throughout two games, and I just have two games in case there's a couple of different things. Or, But generally, we kind of have an idea by this point of what it is we need to work on. So we'll just write that down, and then um, I'll send you those notes. I'll just I'll write them down as you're here so that you can ask additional questions or if you want clarification on what I'm writing. Okay. But like even here, your Oriana shouldn't be the one going here. You should be here, right? Oriana should be should be here, and you should be where Oriana is. Um, makes it easier for possible. But we're flashing forward late, so kind of just similar thing, and then we end up dying. So yeah. Okay. Um, you see my notes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll start through the early game and then progress through that, so I'm just going to think back to kind of the early game thing. The first thing is just do not ward river level 1 unless your ADC is following you. It is more important to control bushes and waves early. Uh, again, stop me if you have questions about the specifics of those things. Um, should I should I ward at all level one, or should I wait no. to ward the river later? You should generally not ward level one. Um, please don't make the mistake of warding the enemy's bush level one, like the one that they have you know control of in the lane. If you do that, there's no benefit because you will see them. Like you'll know they're in the bush if you don't see them anywhere else. And if they do kill the ward, they get level two before you. And so it's do not ward that. So just don't generally ward level one. Um, basically, what you're going to do in terms of warding is if you're getting pushed back in lane and you have no prio, then you're going to ward like this bush down here that I'm kind of pointing to, because that'll give you yeah. maybe if you're going to get dove or something, for example. Um, and then if you're winning the lane, you have priority, you ward up here or you ward here. Um, just in a more aggressive spot. And that's usually going to be after level 2 or after level 3. Basically, right after you crash a wave under their turret, they are going to go for a ward like that. Okay. So we'll write something along the lines of warding as well. Uh, for warding, wait to ward until you crash a wave. 
round level two or three and it's sometimes going to be later like if you end up fighting really hard in the lane you might not have time to word and that's fine generally you're not going to be ganked as well until one minute and 20 seconds ish that's when scuttle scuttle spawns at 125 but like the earliest you'll be ganked is 125 ish generally speaking usually a little bit later um but generally um wording wait to word until you crash away from level three if you have prio then ward i'm just going to write aggressively we spoke about the specific words that you could do um mm -hmm. if getting pushed back then ward defensively uh, okay three what are the early game things um just early game use bushes more and target enemy ADC when your ADC is engaged on. Um, make engages, can't type, make engages based on our jungle pathing. That was the thing, especially in the first game. You were playing a lot more aggressive, I think, like when your jungler was not there. And we should make our kind of choices a lot more based around our jungle pathing as well, if we don't know specifically um like when to go in or whatever i think those are the main things i can think of for the early game i don't know if there are any other things you remember us talking about but um no i think like standing in front of my adc instead of hanging back was another one but yeah and that's going to be more for like the general like just at every point in the game um just generally try to be in front of your team focus on making space and then along those lines um before objectives are spawning try to control mid lane bush and ward over the walls or in bushes Basically, try to get more aggressive words. Your words on the objective are only really meaningful if you have no better option. Because if you have control over the objective, your body is going to give you vision of the, the dragon pit. You don't need a specific word there. That word being over the blue buff means that your Varus can channel the first ability and poke them over the wall. Or having a sapling in the bush can stop a set from being able to dive on your teammate as quickly. Or just all these different things. Having our vision in a more aggressive spot allowing our teammates to make a lot more like uh, aggressive plays and just understand where the teammate or the opponents are is a lot more beneficial. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Target priority, focus, enemy carry, and keep track of spells, ways they will respond. When I say ways they will respond, I just mean will they flash it, will they use a cast and then dash, what, how will they get out and how can we respond to that? For example, Sometimes you wait out a champion's dash, and then you use your CC. That way, they're locked in place. They don't have any way to escape afterwards. Or if they have a flash, maybe you go on someone who doesn't have a flash. These types of things, kind of depending on, obviously, the scenario. Um, then also, uh, this is the thing for the first game. Um, play around whoever is strongest. Like the casting game, I think it's pretty. We talked about that a lot, so I don't need to yeah. reiterate too much. But then, generally in mid game, try to rotate with mid jungle a lot and make plays around the map. Because again, generally speaking, you're gonna have an ADC farming side and a top laner farming side, and so then wherever your jungle and mid go, you're gonna have four people there. But if you're not there, they're only gonna have three. It's a lot worse and if you're just trying to make a play with one person obviously less numbers makes it harder and it's all situational like i said if you have an adc who's giga fed play around them instead just have to be able to, to have the like critical thinking ability to determine what's going on in a specific game but um I'm trying to think mm -hmm. about what else we spoke about i think these are a lot of the main things i don't know if there's much else that we spoke about that's really valuable but yeah i, th uh, I mean i think yeah, I think that was pretty much like all the big things anyway. I'm um, I'm trying to yep. think back, but I think you've covered it all. Yeah, and then I'm just going to write this as like the general thing. Have a mindset of making much more aggressive plays and be okay with dying because that's just like the general thing. 
I just want you to be okay with making mistakes and kind of shifting out of the enchanter mindset. But yeah, if you don't have any other questions um, at all, then I'll just copy paste these notes and send them to you. So.